Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you are very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And I'm fairly sure that by now we are all well aware that King Henry VIII had quite the bee in his bonnet about not leaving his throne to a daughter. Only a son would do for him, apparently. And there were numerous possible reasons, or maybe that should be excuses, depending on how you view it, for him to believe as he did. Perhaps, though, anxiety over regnant queens was partly fuelled by the problems that were experienced some four centuries earlier, by Matilda, those who supported her, and by the wider realm. The life of Matilda is the focus for today's video, so let's hop in. Matilda was born around the 7th of February 1102 to King Henry I of England. He was the fourth son of William the Conqueror and Matilda of Flanders. Henry's first wife, the mother of his daughter Matilda, was another Matilda, this time of Scotland. I am aware that is by our count now three Matildas, which is entirely too confusing, but we will do our best. Our Matilda's maternal grandparents were Malcolm III, King of Scots, and Margaret of Wessex. She was a member of the pre-conquest royal line and was thus related to Edward the Confessor. In short, our little Matilda of England had a regal ancestry by anyone's standard. Young Matilda would soon be joined by a brother, William, and while her little brother would be raised to follow his father Henry as king, Matilda was being set up for a future as the wife of a powerful and prominent man. And so, she was educated to be a great lady, to stand out as the chief ornament to whatever household, court and nation she was going to marry into. It's likely that she studied languages, learnt how to run a household, estate and a kingdom, if the need should arise, should, for example, her future husband be absent or incapacitated. She would have been immersed in fashionable cultural pursuits and guided towards piety. In 1109, when she was seven, Matilda's future appeared to be mapped out through her betrothal to the approximately 23-year-old German king, Heinrich, or Henry V, known at that time as the King of the Romans. The following year, at around the time that Matilda would have been turning eight, she travelled with an elite revenue to the lands of her new husband to the lands that were going to become her new home. The couple met in Liège and then travelled together to Utrecht where they were formally betrothed in person on the 10th of April. Matilda was crowned at Mainz a little over three months later on the 25th of July. Due in part to her youth, her focus for her first few years in her new lands would have been on completing or indeed furthering her learning and on fully preparing herself to meet the requirements of her new position she was placed in the care of a guardian. He was one of her husband's most favoured and trusted counsellors, Bruno, Archbishop of Trier. As her husband focused on the business of governing, Matilda stayed at Trier, where she learnt the language and customs of Germany. At the start of 1114, the by now 12-year-old Matilda's marriage was finally solemnised. By this point, her husband was the Holy Roman Emperor. Matilda would have another coronation, once again at Mainz. This marriage would last 11 years, and it would be ended by the death of Heinrich V on the 23rd of May 1125. Matilda's teens and early 20s were thus spent as his empress. This couple would not produce any children, or at least not any that survived. Nevertheless, Matilda was seemingly very popular with her husband's subjects. Her youth would not prevent her from, from the very earliest point, acting as a patron and or intercessor for those that she found to be deserving or in need of her support. Heinrich had much to deal with, including civil war, disputes with the Pope, which led to his excommunication at one point, and contests over his rights to inherit vast lands in Italy. When he was on campaign, Matilda served ably as his regent. This role included, but was not limited to, presiding over courts and pronouncing judgments. When her husband's missions were more diplomatic, she would accompany him, 
to the apparent delight of those living in the lands they travelled through, as they sought to resolve Heinrich's conflict with the papacy. The conflict that left him excommunicated, Matilda may have had the opportunity to forge her own network of influence among some of the most connected and powerful members of the clergy of her day. Heinrich would come to terms with the papacy in 1122. By this point, the situation had changed considerably in the lands of Matilda's birth. Her mother had died in 1118. Then, two years later, in 1120, her only surviving full sibling, her father's sole legitimate male heir, William, was travelling from France to England aboard the White Ship. On this voyage, he was accompanied by many nobles and some of his illegitimate half-siblings. The party were delayed in leaving until after dark. Reportedly, they had been drinking heavily. Soon after setting sail, the white ship struck a rock and went down. There would be only one survivor, but that survivor would not be the 17-year-old William. Upon hearing this news, King Henry I was, I think understandably, reportedly devastated. It is said that he collapsed to the ground when he heard word of his son's death. It would not be long, however, before his mind turned to the production of another legitimate son, who might be an heir to his realm. The white ship had sunk on the 25th of November, 1120. Two months later, on the 24th of January, 1121, Henry I married Adeliza of Louvain at Windsor. Whatever he hoped, this marriage would produce no children. The death of Matilda's husband Heinrich in 1125 could have been followed by her remarriage to another German prince. After all, many had reportedly expressed their desire in her hand. Her father, though, now had other plans for her. Matilda returned to England in 1126, and preparations were underway for her to be recognised as her father's heir. In the new year of 1127, King Henry I saw to it that the leading nobles and churchmen individuals who were present at court at that time because they held sufficient prominence and esteem that they were invited to celebrate Christmas with their king. They were now to swear oaths of allegiance that they would recognise and support Matilda as Henry's heir. Among this group of oath-takers was Matilda's cousin on her father's side, Stephen of Bois. Fear not, he will be popping up again soon enough. Henry would, no doubt, have still hoped for the birth of a son by Adeliza that would make all of this oath-taking unnecessary. But in the meantime, the succession had to be secured. Along this line of thinking, if Henry was not going to have another son, he could at least also try to create a situation where his daughter might produce one. On the 17th of June, 1128, the 26-year-old Matilda was married to the not-quite-15-year-old Geoffrey of Anjou. It's possible that Matilda might have found this marriage to a young, soon-to-be count, somewhat of a step down from the marriage she had with her former husband, who was, after all, the Holy Roman Emperor. It's possible that her disappointment fueled an apparent rift between the newlyweds. After all, Matilda would separate from Geoffrey and return to her father's court within a year. It is possible, though, that she was also, or perhaps instead, concerned that her marriage created distance from the dominions that she was now heir to, and that this distance risked her claim to them. In 1131, she returned to England with her father. In the September of that year, at a meeting of his council, her claim to be his heir was once more asserted, with oaths being sworn to that effect. With this achieved, Matilda, seemingly happily, returned to her husband. Matilda and Geoffrey's first child, a son, called Henry, was born on the 5th of March, 1133. He was soon joined by a brother, Geoffrey, on the 1st of June, 1134. The succession was now assured. There was now an heir and a spare. The birth of her second son was difficult. Indeed, Matilda nearly died. She would, however, recover sufficiently to fall pregnant again by around the October of 1135. Presumably, she would, or at least could have known that she was pregnant, when her father died on December the 1st, 1135. It would have taken a little while for this news to reach her. Before long, though, she would also learn that her cousin Stephen had broken his oath to support her. Matilda, in Anjou, may have felt that she could trust the two oaths that had been sworn to her as security 
that she would be able to safely inherit the crown. However, when Stephen of Blois learned of his uncle's death, he was closer to England than she was. He was in Boulogne. And so he sailed for England, made his way to London, and promptly asserted his own claim to the throne. Stephen's brother, Henry, was the Bishop of Winchester. He supported his brother's ascent to the throne and his coronation by the Archbishop of Canterbury at Winchester on December 22nd, 1135. The acceptance of Stephen's rule in England led much of the nobility of Normandy to accept him as the Duke there too. Matilda's rights, the oaths that had been sworn to her, were, it seemed, going to be ignored. Matilda made moves of her own. She went to Argentan and there settled into control of her dower lands. It was at the castle of Argentan that Matilda gave birth to her third son, William, on the 22nd of July, 1136. Her husband, Geoffrey, was also keen to assert Matilda's rights. Raiding of Normandy did become the order of the day. In the face of this challenge by Matilda, people did start to renounce Stephen. An early deserter was Matilda's half-brother, Robert, Earl of Gloucester. His changed allegiance allowed Matilda to make gains in Normandy. At the start of 1139, Matilda sought the Pope's support to enforce her rights and the oaths made to her. Stephen sent a delegation of his own to argue for his right to rule. These arguments were heard at the Second Lateran Council. Nevertheless, this dispute would remain unsettled. Successive Popes would refuse to rule in favour of either party. Matilda, by her very existence and willingness seemingly to fight for her rights, offered Stephen's enemies and those who found themselves disappointed by his rule another option. In England, some switched their allegiance. Others rebelled. Matilda's uncle, David King of Scots, attempted an invasion. Before long, Matilda was ready to challenge Stephen at close quarters. And so she, her half-brother Earl Robert, accompanied by a small force, landed on the south coast of England on the 30th of September, 1139. Matilda then made her way to Arundel Castle, where she sought out the protection of her stepmother, Adeliza, who was by then married to the Earl of Arundel. Knowing she was there, Stephen began to lay siege to Arundel Castle. Ultimately, though, a safe conduct was agreed to that permitted Matilda to head for Bristol. There, more supporters began to slowly flock to her cause, and she settled into the surrounding territory that was now under her control. There would be skirmishing throughout the months that followed. There was a battle at Lincoln on the 2nd of February 1141 where Stephen was captured. He was then imprisoned at Bristol. This turn of events only served to draw more people to Matilda's side. So much so that by the 2nd of March, even Stephen's own brother, Henry, Bishop of Winchester, was prepared to come before Matilda and to acknowledge her as, quote, Domina Anglorum meaning the Lady of the English, this being the feminine form of Dominus Anglorum, or Lord of the English, the first among them, their leader, the monarch. At a meeting of the clergy on the 7th of April, it was agreed that Matilda was, quote, Lady of England and Normandy. It was decided that she should be crowned at Westminster in due course, and from then onwards, that she should rule. It has been suggested that Matilda may have intended to hold the throne only until her son Henry, who at that point had recently turned eight, was old enough for her to pass the throne to him. If this is the case, if this is what she truly intended, then she was looking to rule on his behalf for a decade at the most. Matilda, however, still had to contend with those who had sworn their fealty to Stephen, those who had supported his coronation and made those oaths. The clergy, nobility and indeed country was fractured in this regard. Some leading nobles found themselves flitting between Matilda and Stephen as preferences or advantages moved them. The chronicler responsible for the Gesta Stefani, whose preference for Stephen is evident, complained that Matilda, quote, put on an extremely arrogant demeanour instead of the modest gait and bearing proper to the gentle sex, began to walk and speak and do things more stiffly and more haughtily than she had been wont, to such a point that soon, in the capital of the land subject to her, she actually made herself Queen of all England, 
and gloried in being so called. I mean, how very dare she? What is true is that Matilda did run into problems with Londoners. She refused to grant them their requested concessions and they were not happy about it. On top of this, Stephen's wife, who was also called Matilda, there is a theme, was willing to raise a force to assert her husband's rights and to try to see him freed from his imprisonment. This unstable situation did bubble over as Matilda's coronation approached. She was at Westminster in the summer of 1141 to make ready. At this time, the City of London rose up against her. The situation was so unsafe, so dire, that Matilda was forced to flee to safety at Oxford. This violent rejection of Matilda's rule at this point has been put down to a variety of causes. Among other things, it's been suggested that there may have been residual loyalty to Stephen, concerns about female governance, It may have been problematic that Matilda had spent much of her life out of the dominions that she was now trying to claim. Is it possible that this fact rendered her as something akin to a stranger in the minds of those that she now sought to rule? Is it possible that her foreign upbringing, her time as empress, now made her unprepared or even unsuitable to rule an Anglo-Norman empire? In regard to the last of these, Marjorie Chibnall does explain that Matilda's quote, Years as Empress had given her valuable experience of European diplomacy. She had also seen the political dangers involved in a quarrel with the Church, and had witnessed the change in her husband's formerly devoted Chancellor, Adalbert, who, after he was rewarded with the Archbishopric of Mainz, became a leader in the ecclesiastical opposition to his former master. She had been trained in a hard school, where enemies were ruthlessly punished. But she had learned that it was unwise to bear resentment and that former opponents could become useful allies. I wonder what you think the motivating concern or indeed concerns might have been at this time. Let me know in the comments. Matilda continued to attempt to bring the country under her control. She and her forces marched on Winchester and when there began to besiege the Bishop of Winchester's palace. However, soon enemy forces surrounded them. Matilda's force was routed, her half-brother, her leading ally, Robert, Earl of Gloucester, was captured. Matilda did manage to escape. It is said that she rode much of the way astride her horse, as men normally did, so that she might travel faster. Stephen was released as part of a prisoner exchange on the 3rd of November. His freedom was swapped for that of Earl Robert's. Matilda then took up residence and held court at Oxford for the year that followed. Matilda knew that she had to source reinforcements, and so she asked her husband Geoffrey to send some to her. Geoffrey was at this time unwilling, or perhaps more properly unable, to spare the troops, as he was still heavily engaged in trying to bring Normandy to heel. He did agree to discuss the matter, but only with Earl Robert. So, Earl Robert departed for Normandy in the June of 1142. Once there, he assisted his brother-in-law with the final part of the conquest of the region between Falaise, Cairn and Avranches. This process naturally took some time. Nevertheless, the success of this campaign did make it possible for troops to be provided that could serve Matilda's needs in England, and so Earl Robert made his way back with them. He also brought Matilda's nine-year-old son Henry to England at this time too. During Earl Robert's absence, Matilda had been besieged at Oxford by Stephen and his army. Earl Robert's return with those reinforcements unfortunately took too long, and the Oxford garrison had come too close to surrendering. Matilda at this point was unwilling to be captured, and her escape from Oxford at this point is frankly the stuff of legend. In early December 1142, with the land blanketed in snow, Matilda and a small entourage of knights snuck out of the castle, camouflaged in white cloaks. The river was frozen, providing for them a useful footpath. This party then trudged through the snow until they reached Abingdon. From there, they rode on horseback to Wallingford and then on to Devizes and to the heavily fortified castle there. Matilda was at Devizes for the next six years resolute in her assertion that her son Henry was due to be the rightful king and that she, as his mother, was bound and determined to secure his inheritance for him. Her husband, meanwhile, managed to fully conquer Normandy 
by 1144, and so he was named as Duke of Normandy. This, therefore, secured the other part of Henry's inheritance. Henry would spend his time travelling between his mother and his father. In England during these years, the situation was at stalemate. Neither Matilda nor Stephen was able to obtain anything that approached a decisive advantage. This period of struggle, of civil war, which spanned the reign of Stephen, is remembered by history as the Anarchy. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which does refer to Stephen in fairly positive terms for much of it, certainly in regard to his character, is far less effusive about the experience of those who had to live through his reign. We are told that, quote, In the days of this king there was nothing but strife, evil and robbery. For quickly the great men who were traitors rose against him. When the traitors saw that Stephen was a good-humoured, kindly and easy-going man who inflicted no punishment, they committed all manner of horrible crimes. And so it lasted for 19 years, while Stephen was king, till the land was all undone and darkened with such deeds, and men said openly that Christ and his angels slept. The death of Earl Robert in 1147 destabilised Matilda's position. This was compounded by the fact that the Second Crusade was drawing some of Matilda's most powerful and keenest supporters away from her side, and on top of this, Pope Eugenius III was now demanding the restoration of the castle at Devizes back to the church. This is the castle that Matilda was currently using as her base of operation. The castle of Devizes had previously been seized by Stephen. He had seized it from the Bishop of Salisbury. Matilda had then later made it her own. Before long, the Pope grew impatient, so much so that he threatened to excommunicate Matilda. With these pressures mounting, with the situation becoming more untenable, Matilda made the choice to return to Normandy in the March of 1148. At this point, her son and heir Henry was 15 years old. As for the return of the castle at Devizes, she entrusted the same to Henry, seemingly, I think, with a bit of a nod and a wink. Certainly, he would prevaricate over this return for years. Just over a year after Matilda left England, the now 16-year-old Henry travelled there himself. He was determined to pick up where his mother had left off. The King of Scots, Henry's great-uncle David, knighted him at Carlisle. A few months later, he was back in Normandy. At this point, his father handed the dukedom over to him. In September 1151, father and son travelled to meet King Louis VII at Paris so that Henry could swear fealty to him and have his claim to be Duke of Normandy officially recognised. This was done to ensure that any rival claim of a right to inherit that might be made by King Stephen's son Eustace would be superseded. Geoffrey died soon after this. Henry was now Duke of Normandy and Count of Anjou. His subsequent marriage to Eleanor of Aquitaine, who was formerly the wife of Louis VII, at least until the annulment of their marriage, served to expand his French territories and authority further still, although this marriage did really anger Louis. Henry would rely on his mother Matilda to oversee his Norman territories when he was off campaigning or when other business took him away. She was going to find that this was a challenging task a task that was perhaps most difficult during 1153, when Henry was away campaigning against Stephen in England. For Matilda at this point, the challenges came in thick and fast. These threats would, however, soon pass, because Henry had great success in England, so much so that Stephen would soon find it necessary to meet with Henry to find a way to negotiate an end to their conflict. When Stephen's son Eustace learned of these discussions, he was enraged. His father's choice to try to come to terms with Henry, after all, did jeopardise Eustace's own claim to inherit after him. Perhaps this anger might have propelled further conflict, or at least it would have done had Eustace not died in 1135. At this point, Eustace was around 23 years old. Within months, Henry and Stephen agreed to the terms set out by the Treaty of Winchester. According to this, Stephen would remain in his place for the remainder of his life, but Henry was to be adopted and recognised as his successor. Stephen died on the 25th of October, 1154. And almost at once, 
Matilda's plans for her dynasty came to fruition when her son Henry ascended to the throne to rule as King Henry II. Matilda spent the remainder of her life in France. She stayed involved in matters of state and offered her patronage and her funds to a variety of religious houses. She also spent her time advising her son, performing duties on his behalf and on occasion co-issuing charters with him. Matilda did fall seriously ill in 1160, but she would recover and would continue her involvement in the business of government. Mother and son would disagree about the elevation of Thomas Becket to the role of Archbishop of Canterbury in 1162. And considering how that all played out, I have got a video that I will leave linked. It does appear, at least on this occasion, that Mother did know best. It is said that this disagreement over Becket and Henry's ultimate decision to ignore his mother's advice in this regard marked a notable lessening of her influence over him. Although perhaps that lessening is something that's only to be expected, as by that point, Henry was nearly 30, married, and a father of four surviving children, with a fifth arriving a few months after the ordination and consecration of Becket. In any case, I think we should not view this as a complete removal of her influence, simply, and at most, a lessening. Matilda's involvement in matters of state would continue right up until her death on the 10th of September, 1167. She was 65 years old. Matilda was originally buried at the Abbey of bec Elouan, which was later destroyed. Her remains were rediscovered in 1846, at which point she was moved and then reinterred at Rouen Cathedral in 1847. Her epitaph describes her as, quote, great by birth, greater by marriage, greatest in her offspring. Here lies the daughter, wife and mother of Henry. So what do you think of the Empress Matilda? of her attempts to secure the throne for herself and her dynasty, of the legacy she left behind. As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video. I'd also love it if you could pop an emoji or a social glyph in the comments too, because that will boost the engagement, and the more engaged video gets, the more YouTube claim to share it out. As we've been talking about Empress Matilda, I think a queenie emoji. You pick. I look forward to seeing what you choose. You can also find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to the place you can find me on the internet in my description box. Please do follow me over on some or all of those so we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please do share it with your friends. If you like the channel, let some pals know about it. You can tell me you like this video in particular by hitting the thumbs up. Please do subscribe to the channel. If you think you are subscribed, have a check now to make sure you've not been mysteriously unsubscribed by YouTube while you are there. Checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, please do hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that way, YouTube allege they will tell you when I've next uploaded and also when I'm next planning to go live, which I do to talk about the history news, and you are not going to want to miss that. We have, of course, got our failsafe. If you head to my website, I will link it. It's www.katrinamarchant.com. If you go over to the contact page, you will find a little box. Put your email address in that box and that will allow me to send you out an email once a week. And that way I can let you know what I've been up to. I can also send you the useful links to my content that you might want for the coming days. I hope you're going to have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye for now.